Hello, and welcome to what is an interesting topic to discuss. It's going to be an introduction to the whole world prior to World War One in terms of development of armaments. Now, what was interesting was I very much try and encourage the practice of reading history forward. And so this was kind of an interesting thing for me to consider when I was looking at my brassies and thinking about it and discussing it and working whether I was going to use a book or whether I was going to use a website, what was I going to use as my guiding source for, for structuring this all together. And honestly, I decided to go with this particular book, which is one of the other Brassies reprints I have. This is the one of the more thickly bound ones. I do have multiple copies sometimes of Brassy reprints. A um, good example is that I have this version of the 1923, and if you look behind me, you will see this version is also 1923. If I do that, you can sort of see. Yeah. So both 1923. Both very good. Um, I'd have to say that's the, probably easier to read on the writing. That's got all the uh, all the pictures in a far better focus. So there's balances on the two things. And this variant is about halfway in between the two in terms of its scaling. All are interesting. I did consider starting off with the 1906 and 1890 versions, but I couldn't find them. I might have they might still be on loan to someone. And this is this is what we do. This is what history is about. It's about reading it forward. And my own knowledge and understanding of the armaments and the shells and armor and weapon systems of the British ships comes down to a lot of my reading in archive materials, but also a lot of reading of these brassies. And reading things like this. It is making a survey of armour and ordnance matters for the past year. Um, there is apparent, at first glance, what may be described as a period of marking time. But it's not to say that there has been no advance for such a state of things. It is impossible to contemplate. Now, please note, their version of marking time in basic saying there is not much going on in the armless industry in the world. In a fairly large book, but with a fairly large amount of writing, you're seeing pictures each side. There are 48 photos, by the way, of the roughly 96 pages involved. So, um, actually, yeah. technically the whole part three is that. So, uh, yeah, 96 pages is marking time in a year. That tells you, well, that gives you a good idea of what is going on in the world, the complexity we're dealing with. Now, the progress made, however, has been mainly in the development and improvement of existing war material, and effectively the onward movement has not exhibited itself to any considerable extent, either in the increased resistance or change the position of armoured protection in the greater calibre or improved power of the weapons, or in the variations in the design and type of completed vessels. There have been none of the revolutionary changes which at different periods in the past have surprised and disturbed those who are interested in the pr uh, production of your use of naval war appliances. Nor are there now any clean indications of novel or sensational movements in the immediate future. In the guns of about 13 and a half inch calibre, all the powers seem to have found the heaviest weapon for the principal arm to the big battleships and cruisers. But the tendency is still to increase rather than to reduce weight. Similarly, a gun of about 6 inch calibre is now generally regarded as the most useful weapon for the battery which was primarily installed for protection against torpedo attacks, but also may at certain ranges be used in fleet action. Improvements in armour have not given this means of protection any unexpected advantage in its contest with the gun. Recent practice, 
points to a further spreading of armoured protection rather than to any material increase in its thickness. The fact that the advocates for reduction in weight in this direction are again making their voices heard is a point to be noted. But although modification rather than innovation is the prevailing characteristic of the advance made both in attack and defence, the increased range of the torpedo, to which equality with the gun is now claimed, the larger the larger sea-keeping powers and effectiveness of the submarines, as well as the rapid strides towards efficiency made with the aeroplane, all, uh, be all betoken uncertainty in a time to come, and this causes an utmost. Mm, this cause of utmost uh, prepare navalmen, manufacturers and constructors alike, approaching developments and impeding change, uh, in, well, impeding changes of uh, of importance. At no time in history of modern armaments has so much research work been undertaken that has been the case uh, that has been the case recently, and it may also be said that at no point at in time has the development been of so great importance and influence alike in the power rapidity of firing and reliability of guns of all calibers. The firms engaged in the production of the material for naval war are continuously prosecuting experiment and if all information were available the story they would disclose would form a most instructive chapter in connection with modern artillery for naval and coast defence and field work. And as it is with the gun, so it is with the projectile, the torpedo, and the other accessories and adjuncts of naval warfare. Unfortunately, the bounds of secrecy increase apparently almost indirect ratio with the value of the information which could be disclosed. The British government and the foreign powers to, for which these firms are doing important work compel them to conform to the binding conditions to secure secrecy. And it is the interests of patriotism the public must best be satisfied with the assurance that the Admiralty is securing the best that ingenuity and experience and unrestricted expenditure on our experiment can give. There is, however, a tangible proof of the severity in the circumstance that many powers are adapting the specialties and inventions of the British firms, and to this extent also the industry and enterprise of the great companies which manufacture material, war material must be economic advantage to the nation. Now, that's an interesting thing to say, because if you watch the video which will come out on Thursday, I think, last night, and the video which will come out on Saturday, I have talked a lot about the reality of naval warfare at this time, that a lot, a lot, of the firm's involved were not really doing proper testing of their stuff. They're doing a lot of research, but they're not testing it accurately in real world like scenarios. And that's the problem. One commentator has already written a minor treatise, an interesting read, on various points. I'm not sure why they put all those points in there on the live, in the comments. They do seem to be, at best, tangentially related to what was said. At worst, they've gone off completely. But, one of the things that comes through is there are a lot of people who are very passionate about the specifics of what was known at the time, or rather, the specifics of technology. But there is a problem in some of the approaches measured. The presumption, and I think sometimes the assumption is, that even if they don't do the proper testing themselves, they still know what the real results would be. And they don't. The best secrets and the best way to keep information hidden is to not know it. The best way to not know it is to just not do the tests. Everyone knows the testing for the British shells, and therefore, to an extent, the British armour, 
was not up to scratch. British armour becomes one of the most heavily tested things in the world. And this is very quickly how it takes place. It actually is a process which starts off with the Orion class. One of the things that's interesting is that whilst Jellicoe is not able to reform the testing of shells and guns, he is able to reform the testing of armour. And so from the Orion class onwards, the armour on British battleships gets a lot better, as well as thicker. And British capital ships as a whole, the, the cruisers, as this book is very keen to emphasise, battle cruisers are cruisers, not battleships. Hence it says, battleships and cruisers, the largest armaments of battleships and cruisers. However, you're able to justify the testing of armor. Why? Why does that come about? Why is the Orion class able to justify it? Because of German allegations made about in the press about the quality of their 11-inch guns still being able to pierce British armor. And so testing has to be done. And the British government, the Royal Navy, looks at testing which the armament company's proposing and goes, What kind of twaddle is that? And the directors of naval construction get involved and they produce various testing barges. And actually, the full sized workup of ships' hulls and have them fired at and see what happens, see what the effect is of them being fired at by guns that are of suitable size and capability. There is a problem with it, though. There is a problem. Why does that same testing not then test the shells? Well, that's the dirty little secret. Of course it does. But no one's examining the shell data. Everyone knows the shells aren't working. But the companies that produce the shells are not going to budge. And every time it's pushed forward, it's not done. One of the interesting things is the amount of hiding that goes on behind the various phraseologies. And when exactly these phraseologies start to come in. And when they go out of service. It, this caused quite a lot of interest again in the live when I was talking about the various shells. Now, of course, lidite, common lidite shells were yellow. And again, I'll discuss this more, and you'll see this in the long patrol to do with the um, green boys. But one of the things that is often misunderstood about the shells is whilst lidite is a very powerful explosive it's a very powerful explosive if contained to contain that explosion uh, to contain that force and cause it in channeling to a more powerful explosion if your shell disintegrates around your explosive and your explosive therefore fragments up or even worse turns into powder and just dissipates it fizzles at best it certainly doesn't explode. Now, why did the British not notice? Well, when testing the armor, they too test some of these shells. They are, of course, tested under perfect conditions. They are not being loaded at sea with movement going on. They are shells which are spe uh, have been specifically ordered for testing. And therefore, the armaments companies occasionally take a very, very different approach. It's amazing how refined and good quality they can make the products when they want to. Common Luddite. 
are starting to be replaced by high explosive when World War One begins. Principally because of its problems. And also... That it's phytric acid... Mm. Ah, picric acid. I wonder call phytric acid. I don't know why. Is one of the more um, hanapodous, worrying forms of explosive. It has an effect on it, and it is also, to an extent, as just as dangerous to the user as it is to the receiver of the shell. Then we have the common pointed shells. Or sometimes referred to as um, the gunpowder shells. They are mostly found in 12 pounder quick firing guns. But they're still around in Model 1. They are a big part of Model 1. Now, common shells are another thing that comes about. And some of them are still in service in 1914. They are gunpowder shells, and then there's, of course, a common lidite shell, which replaces them. But the point I'm trying to make is that there are a lot of different shells going for at a time. And a lot of different shells available to theoretically being tested. And should have been tested. Should have been tested. But. It is sometimes far easier to make the case of, oh, oh no, 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 our shell's good. What we need for this though is a new type of shell. Oh yes, a new shell to make to deal with that threat, and a new shell for that threat. Which is where the research comes in. Instead of making the shells they had as good and as viable as they could do, they kept researching and getting money to research new shells. And this is something which we have to deal with today. Think about it. How often do you hear the remedy to a problem is to develop something new rather than to make work the things you have? In a video a while ago, I talked about innovators versus efficientators in terms of engineering. There is another problem with the innovator efficientator scenario. Innovators often are better at selling their products. It's easy to go, oh, look, shiny new. This will solve all your problems. Than to go, hmm, okay. It's dull. It looks a bit tattered. But we can make it better. We can make it better. We just need to test it properly and we need to admit we've made some mistakes. Because that's the other thing. When you're being efficient to about something, when you're making it better, you have to admit you've made mistakes. And that is one of the things naval history teaches us, that people have trouble admitting they've made mistakes. Everyone has trouble admitting they have made mistakes. And that's sad. But it's also understandable. Human character, human nature doesn't like admitting when it's at fault. Not because it's a bad thing, not because people are bad, but because 
when you admit your fault, you have to admit, uh, start thinking about when you made that fault. And you start, uh, start doing a lot of self-reflection. And that was really the scary thing when you start looking at the history of the shells used at Jutland and the problems the Royal Navy had them. Because when you go through the sheer number of points of history at which you could diverge and could have fixed those problems long before you got to Jutland. Long before. And... I gave it 18 months and said they need 18 months of wartime to develop the shells and implement it. And that was actually longer than they actually used historically. Historically, it was closer to 12 months. It's an interesting note. Some people put more emphasis, again, in the comments on uh, the committee's investigations than on Treyas. Myself, looking at the pace of work and the amount of information put for it to Put to it, I would say Drea to me takes far more of a lead than the committee does, because the committee is having a harder time admitting that there might be a problem there. Because the committee is going, hang on, if we admit this is a problem, we have to admit there's a problem with the whole naval system, and that is harder for a committee to do than it is for a single person to do. Drea, and this is why he was chosen for it had the sufficient ego to believe that, of course, it was system was wrong, because it wasn't him. Hey, there is a point where people often go, oh, I, 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 I hate that kind of ego. That kind of ego can be useful. That kind of personality can be very useful. If you need someone to look at a system and go, hang on, there's a problem, go and fix it, they need to have sufficient ego to believe that they are capable of fixing that system in the first place. A committee to look into the performance of the guns is a wonderful thing to gather information but as we all know the great phrase is when someone says there's going to be a study or research or they're going to write a they're going to get a, a full in, inquiry conducted into something it's kicking into the long grass and it's not looking at it because again who's responsible for the committee Who's responsible for making sure they deliver something on time? They don't just keep asking for more and more information and then eventually deliver the most wishy-washy piece of paper ever known, ever seen by mankind. Who's to say? The fact, though, it was fixed so quickly... Does those show a benefit of this infrastructure and research and studies which were done? The fact that so much work had been done in the 1910s, in the 1900s, in developing these, in developing every research work, etc., and developments had been done. Once you fix the testing system and the trial system for shells, and actually had them being used against realistic systems you very quickly refined and developed the systems you needed and very quickly found the faults in the shells and fixed them what's interesting to note is that information then has a secondary consequence because that information then feeds into armor development which then feeds into ship design which then feeds into, and you've guessed it, things like the Admiral class and the G freeze and N freeze. This is why we can say they are the products of Jutland. People, when they look talk about it, think, oh, it's a product of the actual fighting in Jutland. No, not as much that, not really. It's more a product of the scientific and technological developments which take place as a result of the inquiries after Jutland into how can Britain build a better battleship? How can Britain build a better battle cruiser? How can they build one which they will still do the jobs they require a battle cruiser for and a battleship for? And those are different, distinct mission profiles. They are. It's something 
I pray we never have the need to really understand again, but there is a very big difference and distinctive mission profile for a battleship versus a battle cruiser. Pretty much a battleship is supposed to take a pounding and keep on fighting. And keep on fighting. You see those ships which especially in after Jutland, which managed to stay afloat despite the severe amount of damage they've taken. And the ones which are quickly repaired and restored to battle fighting order. That's what a battleship is for. That's what some people after Jutland really didn't understand, was that battleships were supposed to take a pounding. That's what they're supposed to be there for. To take a pounding and keep on fighting. Battle cruisers, they're maneuver assets. They're supposed to be able to use range as armor, speed as armor. The speed allows you to maintain the range, the range allows you to maintain the art protection. You're not armored the same as a battle cruiser. Because you're not supposed to be engaging at the same ranges as a battleship. If you're engaging at battleship ranges in a battle cruiser, You've lost. Something has gone terribly wrong. It's therefore, it's not a mistake if a battle cruiser is not armoured the same as a battleship. It's armouring and designing to fit the role. And it's building your guns and your shells to fit the role. But you need to have accurate information to be able to do all that. And the trouble for the British is largest navy or not in the world, some of the best ship designs in the world, in the 19 and in going into World War One. Doesn't mean squat if you have got a valuable area of your tes testing which is not working, and there is not a single nation on earth which can stand there and go, ha ha, at this because all of them have suffered the same thing. I don't need to talk about American torpedoes prior to World War Two. I neither do I need to talk about German torpedoes prior to World War Two, or Japanese torpedoes at during a large chunk of World War Two. All of them have issues, and all of it comes back to the same thing. You need usually you have such a weight of inertia going on behind a system that it is presumed to still be fine. And no one is empowered, or rather no one with sufficient ego is empowered, and the right fund of ego, to go, no, it's not correct, we need to change it. That's where Dreher comes in, that's where Jellicoe comes in. That's where all of them come in. Brassies. Now, there have been many requests for a whole introduction to shells and shell types, and I will attempt to compile that. I am... Um, massively, massively overworked and busy at the moment till the end of March. But I will hopefully have free time in April. And whilst I am wandering around in April, I will probably write that up. And I will use my Brassies books to write that up. And when I've written it up, I will turn it into a PowerPoint and present it to all of you. And I know usually today is a common response video, but I wanted to do... Well, I suppose it is to extend a common response, because it's a response to some discussions had by last night's video. But it's more of a discussion of the realities of the development of weapons. Right. Usually I play Ultimate Animal Dreadnoughts tonight on Twitch. I think probably tonight, if you do log into it, if I'm still going when you drop log into it, I will be playing something different. Maybe Supreme Commander. I haven't played that in a while. 
it's always fun. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I'd love you to turn the historic analysis of when we do these silly things to the present and have a look around you and see if there's anything you see going on where again you need someone to go in and go we're doing this wrong because we're judging this by the same metrics and testing we've been doing for the last couple of decades and now those tests are out of date so that data which we're gathering by them might show us that we're constantly improving but honestly that's no longer valid or useful data be very interested to see what you say take care thank you for watching and have a fun Friday.